I remember looking at the chart thinking, is this gonna be the most stupidest decision of my life? This is an experimental technology. It's not necessarily worth anything. And even back then there was a mindset of look, paying anything more than a dollar for a Bitcoin is just downright stupid. So I took the traders out for, for coffee. Um, I paid them back in Bitcoin, of course, which <laughs> around the time was to pay them back in one or two Bitcoins. Yeah, they, they <laughs> called me up years later, <laughs> either being very thankful or being very quiet because they've lost their passwords. <laughs> Today I have a very interesting guest here with me with Bitcoin prices going up and halving expecting to happen. I decided to bring up a friend of mine that I know has been very long in the crypto space. His name is Joe. He has been in the crypto industry for for more than 12 years, currently is his 13th year. Started in the background in computer science, which most of the early crypto guys are. He went into the investment banking scene and later founded the very first Bitcoin trading platform. Then exited and enjoyed a good time of retirement. Subsequently married a Malaysian and right now he's residing here and also founded a new crypto company here called DeFi Dive, where it inspires to become the next Bloomberg in the crypto industry. Welcome, Joe, to our show. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm really, really glad to be here. Firstly, let's start off with a little bit of your background, right? I understand that your mom and your dad got together and then after that, they uh, moved to the UK. And were you born in the UK itself or were you born in Malaysia or Hong Kong, something like that? My mom moved over to the UK from, from Penang to become a nurse. Oh. My, my dad moved over when Hong Kong was under British rule to study. They met in, in the UK there at a church and then I was born in the UK. So I was born a British citizen, despite being, as you say, half Malaysian and half Hong Kong. And now life has come full circle where you marry a Malaysian and now you're back here. How does your mom feel? Does she feel proud? <laughs> so, so, so that's the most important question of them all because my mom finds it incredibly ironic that she left Asia at a time where there was economic prosperity in the UK, right? So she essentially left the motherland, her home country, to seek out better opportunities elsewhere. That better place was the UK. And now that I've grown up and become an adult, I've now moved back to the place that she <laughs> escaped from. And furthermore, to add to the irony, my brother's moved to Hong Kong. <laughs> so I love my parents very much, but I, I am quite sorry about that. <laughs> But I'm, I'm really enjoying all life the here. the work though. to get you that UK passport <laughs> and both of you are heading back to the exact same place that we left. Yeah. How was it like growing up in the UK from immigrant family, uh, starting from nothing? How was it like growing up for you there? There were some sad parts of the story where, yeah, there was a lot of discrimination, especially back then. The thing about moving as a first generation migrant is you're not always going to get the best jobs, right? You're, you're there to fill a role and it's usually a role that the locals don't want to do. So my mom for many years ended up as a nurse, but not just working as any ordering, ordinary nurse. It was a nurse in, um, in, in the mental hospital working the night shift as well. So she very much hustled to put food on the table to keep us warm in the, in the cold winters in England. And my dad, on the other hand, moved to England to seek a better opportunity for his own education. And he ended up working in a Chinese supermarket there for many years. Again, it's a role which he worked very, very hard in. I'm very, very proud of them as my parents, uh, but they definitely hustled uh, a lot more than you know what a modern family would have needed to to get by. That really shapes my childhood in a way where I saw my parents work very, very hard and it created us as very individual, uh, very independent people, myself and my brother. I recall there was one time you shared with me uh, how you didn't like it when in the past your dad would drive super, super far away just to buy groceries because it's just a little bit cheaper. And so how was it like for you back then when it comes to money? So there were certainly a lot of sacrifices we had to make when we were younger. Um, and it very much informed how I think today. There was uh, this, this fallacy called the tax on the poor where some, some people, if they come from poorer backgrounds, they make decisions that they think might help them financially, but it ends up costing them in other ways, right? It's like trying to save money on parking where you have to walk very far to get to the place you want to go. And perhaps you've traded a lot of time for that convenience of having saved a small amount of money. So there are a lot of these dynamics growing up and it very much gave me the aspiration that look, when I get older, I want to be able to um, afford to park closer to where I want to shop, to be able to shop at nicer places and to be able to live this life where I wasn't wasn't needing to make so many personal sacrifices. Does it shape you like right now when you go to a shopping mall, you were just like, 
you know, if I do not have time to look for parking, let me just go for the valet or <laughs> I just don't mind going over to the nearest grocery store to buy something, although it may cost a little bit more. Absolutely. So there's a number of experiences which shaped my thoughts to, to what I do today, which is definitely um, I'm, I'm more on the side of look paying for the better parking just to save a little bit of time so it can be more time efficient. One of those stories I, I loved was when I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it painted a picture of having two parents, right? One would always make sacrifices to save that little bit of money. That was the poor dad. The rich dad, on the other hand, found ways of using money to help themselves earn more money or to buy themselves more convenience in a way where they'll be able to access more experiences, more opportunities to further themselves, more opportunities to to learn to, to, to build build their own wealth. And having read that story from a young age and having realized, look, I come from one side, but I very much aspire to being on the other side of the equation. It taught me that any of my time in my childhood learning one or the other, and especially in my younger years, it's better to learn how to make more money when you're younger, rather than spend that same amount of time trying to save that equivalent amount of money. Saving money is something we can all learn later in life. But trying to learn how to make more money later in life might be a little bit harder than mm. if you were to challenge yourself to do it when you're when you're younger. That's right. I, I recall also you mentioned to me that the book Rich Dad Poor Dad was bought for you by your dad. Your dad gave it to you. Uh, it seems like that actually does place quite a lot of attention in terms of education, not just in terms of academic, but the way you think and the way you should upskill yourself to be able to make a living, right? Uh, can you share with us what kind of effort do your parents do to kind of help to shape you to be the person that you are today? So one thing that I'm incredibly grateful for about my parents is that they spared no cost or no expense or made so many sacrifices in order to put us through the best education that they could afford. And don't get me wrong, at times they couldn't afford you know the education that I received I did very badly at school in many years uh, they had to move me in different schools at a great personal cost to them I remember one year having to go to a private school for just one or two years uh, but they, of course they couldn't afford to put me through private school for uh, my entire childhood but given that I did quite badly when I was younger they they made an executive decision at a certain point to 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 make a huge life sacrifice. At a certain point, I believe they 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 remortgaged their house to get enough money out wow. to put me through a little bit of private education to try to give me the best start in life that they could. So I have nothing but a huge amount of respect for for what they did, although it came with a huge amount of sacrifice as well. But my parents were always very very open about money as well. They weren't afraid to tell me about the cost of things and have me be aware of the sacrifices that that were made in order to for us to get through as a family uh, and so my dad was very aware to teach me about the fundamentals of uh, finance at a very young age as well which I feel very grateful for. I remember my dad always used to pump out on the radio really loudly um, on the weekends called The Money Show. Uh, it's equivalent Ooh. to some of your radio stations here that talk about business and finance. And I feel like that did have some sort of influence on me at, at a young age as well. Wow, wow. So it's kind of like yeah. the early days of uh, personal finance content, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's very true. Um, when, when I look at my own childhood as well, um, my mom and dad did not spare me the information about how difficult things mm. were. Uh, compared to some of my friends, when I looked at it, their parents were like, let's not burden our child to find out that things are tough. Mm. But that's something that my parents did not do. Mm. And I think it's a privilege because it taught me the value of money. It taught yep. me that things are actually not that easy. So uh, instead, when you look at others who actually were shielded from it, mm. when they have to come to the truth, when they come out of work and realize that, hey, shit, things are not that simple, right? Some of them either crumble or some of them have to learn to accept it at that mm. point, right? So th there's some sort of resiliency that's being built up when our parents actually do that, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. there's definitely pros and cons to that approach. But one thing that I, I think is incredibly clever of my dad to do was to have this foresight that perhaps what he was teaching me as a father may not actually be good enough. To have that self-realization that maybe I should buy this book for my mm. son called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Because yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. some of the stuff I'm teaching <laughs> is not the best. And years later, he actually said, I, I picked up that book that you got on your shelf. I never read it myself, but I gave it to you. <laughs> and I was like, hang on a second. And he goes, I never realized all these years in your, in, in your teens and early adulthood, were you just putting into practice the things that you learned in this book? So I had a, had a moment of, of huge respect for him when he, when he shared wow. that with me. But I, I have a lot of respect for the fact that he seemed to be aware of 
his limitations of his own knowledge as to what he was teaching his own son. I don't know if you felt the same as well. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very true. I think it's mm. very important that as a, as a father or as a parent, right? I think like sometimes we think that we are the best parent, but mm. I think it's important also to know that there are certain things that we can't do. Yeah. Yeah. And there are certain things we're just not good enough. It's like, for example, like your dad, right? If he wants to teach you about the concept of uh, doing well in life and, and, and being rich, right? He has never handled that large sum of money before. He has mm. never uh, been in a position where he had the luxury to keep investing, right? So he's definitely unable to teach you that. And to be able to acknowledge that fact and give you that book, I think that itself, it's something to be very, very proud of. And I hope that those of you guys who are parents yourself uh, do remember that there's no shame in knowing that you have limitations. Uh, like like for me, I, I, I do the same thing. I, I ask my son to get a mentor himself. If it's not going to be me, man, it's fine, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah, it's fine. I don't need to be everything. But having said that, uh, whatever they've gone through in life, right? Uh, uh, you did mention about the book, Reach That Poor Dad, and that changed you. Aside from the book itself, was there any... Sp- specific experience in your life that shaped the way you looked at money or success? And this is a really interesting one. One of the most formative lessons I had at school was when a teacher informally came into the classroom. I I distinctly remember this as a really crystal clear memory. And he comes into school, this was in private school with a maths teacher. And he goes, I just spent my summer teaching underprivileged kids. And you know one difference between you guys and them and then all of us kids in the in the lesson are like no can you can you share us share with us enlighten us he goes there's this one word that describes the difference he looked us square in the eyes and he said aspiration and i was like back then we we're just kids right we didn't know what that word meant we were just like what, what does that mean and he said to us when i teach these kids in the underprivileged school all they desired in their life was to be the manager of their local corner shop, their local 7-Eleven equivalent in the UK. They just wanted to run a shop, work in the retail, stacking shelves, work their way up, get, get into a position of becoming a store manager. When I come in and teach you guys at the private school, you guys want to be pilots, you want to be astronauts, you want to run big companies, you want to travel the world. And he goes, that's the difference in life. You guys, by just aspiring to be somewhere else in life, put yourself in a totally different mind space. And I think that really spoke to me. But again, the sense of irony comes from the fact that the most important lesson I learned at school was not to do with anything that they were teaching on a blackboard. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm sorry, mum and dad. (laughs) But the education wasn't all lost. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's really very true. Because I, I come from a family, just like you, my family wasn't rich. Right, uh, my mom spared no expense in my education. She made sure she sent me to uh, a school here called Damansara Jaya, which uh, many of my friends are actually middle and upper income. And that's when I realized that the way they looked at things were very different. Many of my relatives who actually went to a smaller town school or uh, uh, not as a famous kind of school, right? Many of them, what they will see is that, hey, if one day I can just uh, get a stable job, that will be fine. If one day uh, we can open a little grocery shop, that will be fine. And that's like the pinnacle of life, right? Mm. You open your own grocery shop, that's <laughs> yeah. the pinnacle of life, right? But when I was in that school, I recall many of my friends, yeah, they aspire very differently. It took some time for me to adjust because the early days when I hear them tell me these kind of things, my thoughts were, because you guys are rich, that's why mm. you are able to dream. But someone mm. like me who's poor, no. Mm. That, that's all I can think about because you have the resources. It took me quite some years to adjust to mm. actually know that, hey, no, that's not true. It's mm. how I think that is a problem. To I'm setting my own limit and say that this is the only way to go about. Mm. Yeah, but th- it's a learning journey. Yeah, I think to share a word of encouragement with the audience though, I started to reframe my mindset instead of feeling very sorry for myself in my younger years. I would say to myself, actually, what I've got is a very rare secret superpower. Like being poor gives, if you change your mindset, your back is up against the wall and you have Mm. to fight to get anywhere. But with nothing to lose, you can risk everything. Yep. And you can still know you can get by. Not many people have that gift. And in some ways, sure, it's, it's not pleasant not having the means to live. But knowing that you can survive or get by on just eating ramen and quite happily operate, quite happily still go to school, quite happily log on to the internet and learn things, 
gives you an edge that a lot of people who come from wealth don't have. If you come from wealth, you have a lot of possessions, you're worried about keeping them safe, not having them damaged. You're worried about not losing money. And I find the risk appetite amongst the wealthy is definitely very different from those who have inherited wealth, from those um, Build it who, himself, who've right? built it themselves. Yeah. yeah, And that's a mentality that money can't buy. Liter yeah, literally, it's quite the opposite. So yeah, if you're down in the doldrums right now, let this message pick you up. Look, you have got a secret superpower. Tap into it, have a bit of confidence, teach yourself how to aspire to bring yourself out to a better place yeah. and just go out there and smash it. There's this saying in Chinese, right? That mm. uh, when you look at someone in the eye, you can see that hunger. Yeah, yeah I think that's something that, that is, um, it's a gift that comes out from desperation. Mm. I mean, it can be because you're poor, that's mm. a reason why. It can be for other reasons as well, right? And, and it's hard to explain. I, I've seen people who are very well-to-do who also share the same hunger, mm. right? But most of the time, many of it come out from poverty and mm. lack of resources, uh, either getting looked down on or something like that. But that is that thing that, that caused that, mm. that great motivation, right? As if it's a, it's a feel that is unending to just keep chasing something. Yeah, and, and motivates you to do better in life. It's true, many many of the successful millionaire stories that you see out there come from positions of adversity. I believe there's a statistic out there, perhaps you know it, that you know most of the self-made millionaires out there, a majority of them are actually, sorry, a majority of the millionaires that are out there are self-made as opposed to inherited yep. wealth as well. And yeah, these positions, these, these stories are, are all over the internet of, look, first generation migrant family, discriminated against, struggled to get by, was cold in the winter and then their future life just explodes in, yeah. in, in a huge amount of success and you know hats off to them uh, for the hard work they've put in to get into that position. Now that we know uh, about this part of your early life, uh, later as we come back to the next section, uh, let's talk about how you started dealing with money because we know that you actually started investing at a very early age. So stay tuned guys. We'll come back for the next section. Too busy to stay updated with daily news? Well, there is a better way. Sign up to the Coffee Break newsletter where they'll send you a summarized news on a daily basis. And guess what? It just takes three minutes to stay updated to all the news that you need and become smart. So time-saving and convenient, right? And guess what? They are running a special campaign in between today to 30th of April. They will pick one lucky new subscriber to receive 1,000 ringgit cold hard cash uh. <laughs> So what are you waiting for? Faster go and sign up lah! You actually graduated as a computer science graduate. Uh, what made you decided to choose computer science as a study? So as far as I can remember, I've always had a passion for computers. Uh, when my dad bought home his first computer from work, it was this green and black screen Apple. Every moment he stepped out of the room, I would run over as a four, five-year-old kid and bash the hell out of every single key I could. <laughs> and of course, when he walked straight back into the room, I'll just pretend like nothing ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think he kind of knew though, but since then I've just been addicted to everything computers and I've had a huge passion for everything from programming to even gaming to building computers myself from a very young age and launching websites and, and things mm. like that. It was quite interesting because when you graduated as a computer science graduate, you actually went to work in an investment bank instead of uh, being in programming or in the tech industry. So uh, how was it like during that time? Because it was the early days where banking start to apply much more technology in their services as well, right? Now, how was it like during those days and what was a career looking like for you? So so the difference is in, in the UK, the big, it's the UK is a service industry, right? So the biggest uh, industry sectors there are insurance and banking, the financial services. So when, when you graduate in the UK, a lot of people usually aspire to work in, in, in the finance sector. For me, that was a, to land a job in a retail bank. They're called Barclays Bank, where I, I actually was in a tech division of that bank, right? Uh, so I was in a role called business intelligence. And what my job entailed was to manage large mainframe databases full of the, uh, the data that all of the bank produced. And across all of its branch networks, it was a retail bank. So if you think about it, all of the branches had computers, all of the branches had ATM networks, all of the ATMs and all of the branch computers needed to connect up to the bank's servers. The bank would have 
tens of thousands of servers um, all around the UK as well, backed up in different data centers and all of that information would need to be tracked. So my role there as a business intelligence analyst was to manage the entire uh, IT infrastructure network for the bank. So you were kind of like a network engineer because those days were still LAN cable, there was yep. no cloud, no yep. nothing. It was a proper setting up of servers and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so I mean, it was a, a nerd's heaven. So I, I, I absolutely loved the job. So it entailed everything from finding out how the server architecture worked, how it all plugged in, to how the ATM machines worked. And it gave me quite, quite an interesting knowledge in depth of how the banking system is built. And of course, I'd always have this curiosity and ask my colleagues about how people come on as cli- come, come on board as clients, how they apply for mortgages, how the bank does loans. And my knowledge from there kind of was seeded into a, marry that with a natural curiosity in banking and finance as well. And uh, I was in, in my in my ideal job. Yeah, so. your interest in uh, tech. And at the same time, you were also very much inspired by the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in terms yep. of managing money. So marrying these two together, you're in the right place. But you were describing at one point in your life, during that time in uh, the banking career, there was also the UK's financial crisis period. Before yep. you move on to Australia, you were mentioning that at that point, you felt jaded with the whole financial industry. Uh, why was it so? Yeah, so that's an interesting arc in, in, in my life story because at that point that I graduated, I was super proud to have made it to this stage of life where I can enter the working world. I nailed what was, in essence, one of the most competitive and one of the most sought after graduate schemes in the whole of the UK um, to work at this bank. And I thought, look, society, everyone, my parents are going to be super proud of me. This is a job that I've got. It's a job for life. It's a keeper job that if I stay in for long enough, I'm going to live a, a very good good lifestyle. And then literally a year, year and a half into the, the job, the financial crisis hits. And all of us graduates were given a redundancy no- notice. And at that point in my life, I questioned everything that I'd learned up until that point and thought, have I been deceived somehow? Like... Is this all a joke? Is everything that I learned and studied to be all of a sudden irrelevant? And then these news stories started to come out. Oh, bankers were fixing LIBOR rates, especially at this bank as well. Bankers were lying. You know, the banks were collapsing. Traders were uh, shorting uh, different currencies. I thought at that point, wait, there's, there's something that I don't know about the way the world works. So at that point where I got my redundancy package, I thought... There's something not quite right. And so that informed me in later life to look into cryptocurrencies, which we'll get to. Um, But at that point, it left me wondering, look, is this all there is to life? Before when I graduated, everyone used to think finance was a great job. Now everyone says bankers are bad people. And I feel like I've dedicated my best graduate years of my life, my most hardest working years to a bank that was deceptive to its own clients and I actually felt really quite guilty about that and that's what made me feel quite quite jaded in a way I felt like I in some way contributed towards that deception for the bank to be making money uh, you know off its clients in in ways which were proven to be illegal so even though I was quite far detached from the trader who did these did these illegal things I still felt responsible because I was still working at the same company so I vowed at that moment to to, to not work in the banking industry right. and that explains kind of why when you went to Australia however you ended up in the bank again uh, but this time as a regulatory role right <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, the interesting part of that story was after I got my redundancy package, you know, I, I, I left the bank thinking, look, what do I, I want to do with my life? I had a little bit of financial flexibility at that point. Uh, they gave me a couple of thousand pounds and I thought, look, I can, I can use that money to travel the world. Uh, and at that time, I was networking with some friends in London, some Australians. They were like, look, why don't you do what we're doing in London, but in Australia? So I traveled to Australia, a recruiter got in touch. He said, look, do you want this job at a bank? I was like, no, I just want to get a job in a in, in a bar or a restaurant just to meet people and go out and have some fun. And he was like, you got to be kidding. Look at this experience. It's crazy. Computer science, bank in the UK. You can absolutely make a killing here. I was like, not interested. But he said to me, you promised me you'll go to this one interview. Went to the interview at Macquarie Bank. They said they would hire me straight away. They showed me what they were going to pay me. I turned it over and I saw that it was four times what I was getting paid in the UK. And I was like, okay, <laughs> when do we want to start? 
I'll, I'll go to the bar after work now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it was actually a trip for you to just go down there to have fun, travel for a period, take a break, but and you ended up with a job in Macquarie as a yeah. regulatory person. Right? Yeah, so I, I, end, I the only reason why I accepted that job besides the, the, the salary bump was the fact that it was in regulatory reporting. So I was definitely seen as more of the good, the good guys or right. the guys who would keep the bank in check from unethical behaviors. Uh, and that gave me a unique perspective because everybody at the investment bank, investment banks are very uh, famous for doing this. They, they cherry pick the very best people that they can. So, so when I got there, I just started asking questions from all these guys, economists, the accountants, the financiers. Oh, how does the bank do what it does? How does the bank make money from essentially nothing? And I got a really interesting education in economics from, from my time at the investment bank. Now that we're on the topic of uh, banking, your career there and combining with your investment, it, you shared with me earlier that you started investing even during school itself, right? Yeah, can you yep. tell us how did you come in touch with this whole investment thing? At what age did you make your first investment? So I believe it was shortly after I reached 18, you were allowed to set up a stocks and shares account. Uh, I entered university and I got quite interested quite early on in the stocks and shares market. So after reading a book from Warren Buffett, the world's most uh, successful investor, I thought, look, this thing called compounding is real. The earlier I start, the better it will be. And why don't I look into investing? At that point, I had a student loan and I was living quite a quite a minimalist life, I'd say, you know, again, your secret superpower when you're growing up, if you grow up poor is that you don't you don't generally know you don't need much to get by. So I was eating my my ramen, my baked beans on toast, and I found out that I had a couple of hundred pounds to invest. And I thought to myself, what am I really, really into? So that formed the basis of my own personal investment thesis. I said to myself, look, why don't I buy shares in the companies whose products that I want to own, but I can't quite afford? The very first product that I really aspired to wanting to buy when I was working on my, my summer holiday jobs was an Apple iPod. Mm. Yeah, when it first came out, I was like, this is incredible. These MP3 players, a thousand songs in your pocket. Yeah. I still remember the marketing <laughs> and a huge price tag. Yeah, I was like, yes. there's no way I can afford it was such that. such a luxury during that time, right? But I had about half of the money to make it to towards a purchase of this iPad. But I was like, look, instead of buying the iPod, why don't I just buy Apple shares instead? And that decision to this day has become one of the decisions that I, I say to others has been able to pay for every single Apple product I've ever owned since then, <laughs> actually. Uh, and actually, I've done that quite a few times, actually. I did it when I when Teslas first came out as well. And I was like, I want to own a Tesla, but I don't quite have the, the amount of money to buy. And I didn't want to buy it on credit because... I found out how the banking system works, right? <laughs> <laughs> so why don't I put that money in Tesla shares instead? And sure enough, I can now buy a Tesla with with um, <laughs> what that's worth. But you're still not driving a Tesla, right? <laughs> and now I just I drive a local car called a Proton. <laughs> so it's much cheaper than a Tesla, actually. <laughs> but yeah. I love it. I think that's very true, right? Yeah. It's like um, when, when you start to have such a mentality is that um, when you look at a car and you go like, oh shit, I wish I can own that car. And you take that money and you're like, you know what, I'm going to just get invested. Mm. And when you invest it, you see the numbers grow. Then I don't really need that car. <laughs> exactly, actually. So I, I think I got a lot of these fundamental lessons from Warren Buffett's books, right? They were like, basically, invest in what you know, uh, stick within a bubble of what you know. Uh, and I re remember, equally as iron ironically, he's like, oh, but don't invest in tech. But then all my mm. life, I'd, I'd studied tech and been passionate about tech. So I was like... <laughs> Screw that piece of advice. I'm just going to follow his other bits of advice and just <laughs> invest in what I know, which is the tech stuff. So, yeah, I ended up buying, uh, collecting some shares in quite a few of the tech companies. And those were the very, very early days. It means yeah. you went through the volatile period. Yeah. Even the early days of Amazon, Apple. Yeah, Google I, I yeah. held as well. Yeah. Steve Jobs left, coming back again. Yeah. Stuff like that, right? You've seen the whole episode of it. Yeah, yeah. but, I, but I, I don't want to send people this message that, you know, I got it right all the way along. You know, I, I certainly made a lot of bad picks along the way. And it was only from learning those mistakes that I became the investor that I am today. You know, underprivileged or with not much money to invest is, hey, you are not got that far to fall if you lose everything. Yeah, so right. there were a couple of occasions where I bought some shares in some bad telecoms companies. They, they dropped a mm. lot in value. But I said to myself, optimistically speaking, if I'm going to lose it all, I'd rather lose it all when I'm playing with small amounts of money as opposed to when I'm playing with larger amounts of money later That's in life. Right. So there's this thing that I always tell our audience here is that 
Uh, if you dare not click the buy button at 500 bucks, you will never click a button to buy at 500,000 or 50,000. And it's best that you start clicking at 500 or 1,000 because if you lose, you only lose 500 or 1,000. Mm. Better than you just start with 50,000 and you lose everything. Yeah. yeah. When I lose money, I take it as a lesson. Oh, that lesson cost me 500 bucks as opposed to 500,000 bucks. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So. And, and I think one of the benefits of it is, uh, I, I'm not sure for you, but for myself, when I started investing in the early days as well, uh, because there was a lack of resources, a lot of the investment were in small amount. It, it, mm. it took time to accumulate. So that kind of gave that advantage of a dollar cost averaging going on. And after about a year or two, you start seeing the figure growing. It's only after a year or two, you have something to shout about and say that, hey, I've made the right decision. Mm. Unlike some other friends who actually have a large sum to start with, it that emotion is much more volatile because at the moment they put in, within the next one year, they're going to see something, right? Mm. If not, it's really difficult. But for myself, it was a lot more dollar cost averaging. Mm. So it kind of eases that whole emotions out. Mm. What, what about yourself? Did you accumulate like a lump sum then you start investing or during student days you just every month or every year you just put in some money how, how did it work for you so i'm glad you asked me that because it, it actually starts from my very first share purchase and i can talk through the emotion the, and the excitement of it all i was like yes i can finally own stocks and shares i got my brokerage account set up and you know when my student loan came in it came in in batches right so it's not like you had a, a, a salary uh, i worked summer jobs so i had a bit of money from there as well my very first share purchase i remember what happened i thought to myself whenever i get a new bank account i always like to transfer a small amount of money in to see that it that it works so i i, I logged into my online banking um, and I clicked the transfer button, it was for £100. I sent it to my brokerage account in my bank and I was super excited. I, I looked for a share, I, I believe it might have been Toyota or one of these companies that ended up being a bad decision, but that's not the lesson. I was like, I'm going to buy the share now. I clicked the buy button with my £100 of shares and I became a shareholder. And then I looked down and it was like, it said, these shares are worth £93. I was like, I thought I bought £100 worth of shares. <laughs> it was like, uh, the transaction fee was £7 on a buy. And then I was like, oh, I'm excited and all, but for this £100, I've paid £7 fee and I've got £93 worth of shares. And I've also taught myself that if I'm to cash in, I have to sell that shares. So I have to pay another <laughs> seven pounds on the fees. So I'm calculating, right? Actually, for, for me to make money on the share purchase, it has to go up at least 14 or more percent because seven pounds, seven pounds, actually percentage wise is actually a lot yeah. larger. It's more like 20% the share has to go up. I was like, actually, 20% in the stock market may take years. <laughs> but there, there again, my secret superpower, if you're playing with small amounts, you, you learn these things very early on. And I learned, um, and the, one of the most fundamental important fundamentally important lessons in wealth management and one of the most misunderstood things about banking is people think it's always about the big numbers the one thing that the the one secret that all the banks know that all the banks exploit is they know in reality it's all about the small numbers the small percentages here and there that they charge without you seeing that accumulates to a huge amount but then I learned this lesson at a very young age, 7% here, 7% there. <laughs> you need to get a 20% return. That that doesn't add up. And so, yeah, as I dollar cost averaged, I started to do it with larger and larger amounts of money because I realized, look, percentage wise, it would just make more sense. And yeah, if anyone's learning about the early days of finance or if anyone's a student right now, I'd encourage you to just look at the small savings here and there. You can make all the small gains in percentage gains. And then what Warren Buffett teaches you to you is that compounding is that secret superpower, which can really amplify your wealth in the long term. By the time you graduated your university, right? Uh, how much have you accumulated in investment? I'd say it was around, I can't remember exactly, but it would have been around 10,000 pounds worth of shares. Wow. Yeah. So I was quite diligent in saving. I was quite diligent in living uh, below my means as well. But I'd also learned some really clever mechanics in the UK student loan system as well. And in the fact that they would give you student loans to, to, to study and pay your pay your student fees, but they're also the cheapest loans that you'll ever get. They were offered at the base rate. And I learned that it was more advantageous to use that money to invest <laughs> than it was to take that money and pay back or not draw down on the loan. After that, you were talking about your investment in tech. And then you took one step further. You went to even more tech than ever, where you got to learn about Bitcoin. Yep. Right? And your journey in Bitcoin is one of the things that is 
truly, truly, truly interesting to me because uh, being one of the earlier investors in Bitcoin, uh, you did mention to me in the past, you used to have coffee with your colleagues and you would pay them in Bitcoin, right? And that time, one coffee, you would pay them back 0.5 Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whoever ex-colleague is Joe's, <laughs> uh, if you ever happen to be watching this, congratulations. They know yeah. who they are. <laughs> they know who they are. Yeah, congratulations, <laughs> yeah. But the point is, right, uh, at what age was it that you came in touch with Bitcoin and what got you to invest in Bitcoin? Because you seem to be a very diligent person and you seem to be quite cautious as well. Yeah. And now suddenly there's a whole new asset class coming. And what do you see in it? What age was that? Uh, so this was in 2011 where I first came across the Bitcoin white paper. The backstory to that, I was, I was in my late 20s or early 30s at, at that point. So you were already working 20s. in the bank and that was post the UK financial crisis? Yeah, so I'd, I'd moved over to Sydney, Australia at that point. I was living there quite happily. I was about two years into my job as a regulatory reporting analyst, managing their mainframe computers there. Yeah, and, and, and as a regulatory person. Absolutely. <laughs> many ironies in my life story. Uh, but then I, I gained a reputation in the bank for being this kid who was just always curious. Like every day I'd just see who I can take out to learn off, right? I've always, not very clever at school because I didn't, didn't, didn't learn like that, but I would love to learn off other people when they share their experiences. So I'd have this habit of taking people out for coffees and I'd just ask them a barrage of questions of things I wanted to know. So I'd take out the, the economist in the office, a really clever guy, and I'd be like, how does central banking work? How does quantitative easing work? What do those words even mean? What's a interbank lending rate? What's a interest inter what's a base rate? You know, how does it all work basically? And I I had this advantage of being able to access, you know, some really smart minds. But I got this I got this reputation in the bank of being somebody who would always ask the questions. So they would also pay that favor back to me. Whenever there was something out there in tech, they knew that I was all over all the tech stuff. I could explain anything to anyone from a tech perspective. One day, a couple of the guys forwarded me this Bitcoin white paper. They're like, Joe, we came across this white paper where we don't understand what it, what it says, but we know you're the exact right person to explain it to us. When I read through the Bitcoin white paper page by page, I think the text is actually about eight pages. All the hairs stood up on the back of my arm. There were shivers down my spine. I looked up from my computer and I knew from this moment on that the, the words that I'd just read were going to change everything. So the years earlier in my computer science classes, they were basically teaching us about some problems in computer science that were impossible to solve. The Bitcoin white paper introduces a concept which solves certain cryptographic problems. And I thought, this is the first time that money is presented by, you know, what we call in technology a protocol. And that moment I took it as significantly as the invention of the internet in and of itself. When I looked up from my screen and looked across the, the office at the, at the bank, I knew at that point that in the future, the bank would look very different and half the people there would not have their jobs. I always questioned when I was working at a bank, why this guy got paid six figures for pushing around an Excel spreadsheet, why this guy got paid six figs for pushing a CSV file around. And when I saw Bitcoin's white paper and read what it did, I was like, this is game changing. I committed at that very moment, the moment I opened this 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 PDF to read the Bitcoin white paper, by the, by the end of page eight, I committed to leaving my job and making something to do with my life's work related in some way, shape or form related to this technology. Right. It took me a couple of months to figure out what that was. Uh, I had an entrepreneurial journey in my, in my moonlighting yep. hours to, to, to make that happen. Uh, but there was a point where I started to make enough money through uh, setting up a crypto startup to be able to quit my job. I would like to ask you, maybe you can explain to us in layman terms, obviously, right? Uh, what did you see in this whole creation of the blockchain of Bitcoin at the point, especially for you as a computer science person and as a regulatory person in the bank who totally understand this? Because when Bitcoin came about, a lot of people from the regulatory side and the banking side finds that this is outrageous, this is crazy, even bullshit to a certain mm. extent. The crypto guys, I mean the tech guys were like, wow, it solved a very important protocol. Yeah, uh, and again, the language mm. that normal human beings cannot mm. understand. Yeah. And this both group of people saw something in it, but for the normal people like 
me and many of the audience here, we, we can't really wrap our head around how significant this thing was really, right? Try to explain to us in a layman fashion that why is it so inspiring actually? I can approach this from a couple of angles and uh, the most basic angle is this. I saw at that point I'd been working in the banking industry for about seven years, just shy of seven years. And I realized that half of the employees at all the banks I've ever worked at are involved with one task. From a computer science perspective, you would have thought it's the easiest task in the world. The task is just to track the movement of money. It's what? literally a number on a spreadsheet that goes from one spreadsheet to another. That's essentially almost all of what a bank does or a variation of that. To track the just movement track of money. the movement of money. It's from a scientific perspective, you know, you don't have to have a degree in rocket science to think to yourself, actually, it's fundamentally not a hard thing for like a computer to do right. And then come the, you know, the, the financial crisis, I realized that the flaw isn't the counting of it, but it's the human psychology aspect of it. But what if we can remove that element of deception from the equation? What if we make it about the hard science? sciences and what i realized when bitcoin's code came about was it was the most traceable transparent fully audited and fully accounted money system that the world has ever seen before it didn't exist before that moment and bitcoin bitcoin's blockchain every single transaction can be tracked and traced to an incredibly precise level eight decimal places is one satoshi 0.0000001 000 bitcoin is the smallest amount of bitcoin and i realized at that point look when people in banks can't even count to two decimal places accurately to the point where a huge amount of people lose a huge amount of money why is this not a game-changing technology for a bank to to one day adopt now it sounds more humanly understandable yeah. from your perspective at that point yeah. in time. Yeah, I never thought of it that way that the whole bank is actually a lot about tracing money. Yeah, uh, I saw it as a middle man, but as someone who's a outside person, mm. we, we, we don't really get the inside mechanics, mm. right? But for you being there, what you saw was exactly what Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain is actually doing. It does uh, automatically. Yeah, but just without doing it automatically yeah. and removing the human element of manipulation yeah. that's involved, right? It's a lot less mistakes. It's a protocol. It's flawless. It relies on cryptography, which is many years earlier have been has been proven flawless as well. And I always thought, you know, technology adopts uh, disrupts different paradigms of the world. It disrupts disrupts healthcare. It disru disrupts the way we socialize. It disrupts the way we consume media. You know, the last paradigm which technology has not yet disrupted yet is is money. And when Bitcoin's protocol came about, I knew it was time for finance to go through technology technological disruption. It's quite interesting because um, do take note for the audience that are watching this, right? If there's something they have to understand here is that. The, the inspiration here is not about finding an opportunity to make money. It, it, it's not like I found the next Tesla or something like that. Mm. It, it is more of I found a technology, like the new internet is going to change mm. the way things are kind of stuff, right? It's more of mm. a technological breakthrough, as you say, a new thing altogether. It's not so much of a money-making thing, not so much of a new type of investment that came to mind immediately. Mm. But yes, those are the byproducts of the discovery of such things, such as the internet. When it first came out, there was email. And yes, there's a byproduct of opportunities to build Google, a search database and mm. so on. But the, the exciting thing is about linking stuff up via a new technology and changing the way you behave. Mm. Yeah. So what we're gonna do right now is that we're gonna take a break and we're gonna dive in into your journey as a crypto startup after that and exiting the crypto scene. Hey everyone, I hope you are enjoying the content from this video. If you enjoy content that can help you make better decisions in money and life, well, check out our other channels here as well. You mentioned to me you bought your first Bitcoin in 2011 and then you built the first Bitcoin trading platform in 2013, which was Magna. Can you tell us that journey uh, from buying your first Bitcoin to starting the first cryptocurrency startup? Of course. So the moment I discovered the Bitcoin white paper, I was absolutely obsessed by the technology. There's a meme that goes around that says I'm in it for the tech. And I truly was back then. So uh, once I spend the following few weeks just reading everything I could on the Bitcoin talk forums, you know, the, the community was very, very small at that point. Not more than a thousand or so active users all around the world, mostly computer scientists. I thought, look, the only thing that's left for me to do is actually just buy some Bitcoins to just play with them just to see what it does. But again, it wasn't done with this for crazy, incredible foresight that I knew it would be 
you know, 68, 70K today, right? I just wanted to play with it. Back then, the first Bitcoins I bought was an, at an exchange called Mt. Gox. And then to, to install a wallet, it's not just a matter of just clicking download on a wallet software on your phone. It wasn't even about clicking download on a browser plugin. We're talking, this is the raw executable file that you run in a command line bar on your computer. You install it running quite a few complicated commands, connect to the network, which was all manual by commands. You have to synchronize the entire blockchain oh. <laughs> and then you can create an address and track the Bitcoins, which you can send from the exchange to your wallet. And so this was how Bitcoin came about, right? And again, it was like, this is an experimental technology. It's not necessarily worth anything. And even back then there was a mindset of look, paying anything more than a dollar for a Bitcoin is just downright stupid like it's <laughs> it's nothing it's an experiment it's anything funny money. more than a dollar was downright stupid i, I remember time. looking at the chart thinking is this gonna be the most stupidest decision of my life because honestly like what people do and people perhaps do this today right they look at the price of an investment and they look it backwards right and of course it all the investments always come from down here right and i was like following the 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 chatter on the forums and people were like oh it's stupid that i even got to one cent and then from one cent, it went to 10 cents and people were like flaming on the forums. So I don't know why people are buying it. It's it's pointless. It's worth nothing. It's supposed to be our pet experiment project, right? Exactly. And people are buying this seriously. You know, this is a cryptographic. A investment. Yeah. Exactly. People are buying this as a cryptographic experiment. We're just testing this little protocol that we're playing with. You know, some people find this code interesting and as did I. And then when it reached a $1 mark, people were like, there's a word for this. It's called parity. It's stupid. What? Why are people buying this? <laughs> And I, I, of course, entered at two dollars, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking I'd missed the boat back then. Uh, but yeah, it got me a chance to really play and learn about the technology. Uh, and from that moment, um, I just thought to myself, "Look, what can I do besides send it back and forth?" You know, I ran the node, I tried out the mining software for a little bit. I got to learn about the fundamental economics and the game theory behind it, because there's quite a lot of game theory and politics behind the way they built the system as well, to have um, a fixed supply that would follow an inflationary curve as more got released, and then start to follow a deflationary curve once they were distributed amongst um, a, w a wide enough audience. I thought certain elements of its design were so simplistic, but so beautiful when all combined together, that I thought, look, this is a technology that I want to dedicate some time to. So in my free time, again, I'd ask the, the guys at work, look, I want to, there's this currency called Bitcoin and I want to build something related to this. I don't ever recommend anyone at work to, to try this, but I was telling a few people at work, they're like, yeah, the, the traders downstairs use this thing called arbitrage. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll create these bots to automatically trade and perhaps you can do something like that as well. So I took the traders out for, for coffee. Um, I paid them back in Bitcoin, of course, which <laughs> around the time was to pay them back in one or two Bitcoins. That's one a very or half expensive Bitcoin. cup of coffee. Yeah, they, they <laughs> called me up years later, <laughs> either being very thankful or being very quiet because they've lost their passwords. <laughs> That's a story for another hey, day. Hey, <laughs> Joel, uh, is there any way of me recovering my password? Or do you happen to keep it? <laughs> Again, side segment is I didn't realize that back then half the crowd thought I was kind of deceiving them as well. So I'm sorry if you ever felt deceived for the fact that I wasn't paying <laughs> you back in real money back money. then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, me this guy going. chipped me. He paid me back in this stupid funny money, which the, in, which the news outlets say is for scams and <laughs> drug dealers, as did my parents. <laughs> that, that told me. Um, but yeah, I was, I was absolutely fascinated by technology. I started to explore doing different trades with this, uh, with with Bitcoin. So buying it on a cheap market in the US dollars and then bringing it to Australia and selling it on the Australian dollar market. That's called arbitrage trading. And yeah, I'd, I'd basically ask these traders how the bank built some of its system and I'd go and moonlight interested in code back then. So I'd just code up different trading algorithms and just try experiment with them, see if I could earn some money on the side. And those trading algorithms ended up working quite well. And I got to make quite a lot of money through arbitrage trading, automated arbitrage trading, uh, whilst I was still working at the bank. But again, reading different Warren Buffett books this time, uh, there was a quote that jumped out at me that, which said, look, in a gold rush, if this was a gold rush, it's not the people digging for gold that make the most money. It's the people selling the shovels, the shovels and axes. That's right. So I was just like, what's the crypto equivalent of selling shovels and axes? At this point, I'd made a little bit of money. I think I turned a $100 initial investment. I bought 
50, uh, 50 Bitcoins for $100 was my first purchase. I thought, you know, what's the way I can use these funds? I'd, I'd grown that balance from $100 to about $200,000. And yeah, only a small proportion of that was through capital appreciation. So a lot of it was through the trading activities. I thought to myself, it's cool and all. It's, again, it's just an experiment, but this was starting to be worth something. What's a way I can remove the speculative element of what I do because I found it very stressful having to monitor the code the code would execute wrong sometime it would end up selling all my bitcoins at a really mm. cheap price and rebuying it at a, re a very expensive price you know I found it quite stressful so when I read this book this quote jumped out at me look I need to change from being the trader to being the trading platform and this was the real education I got from my banking years look I want to be in a position of the bank so I spent the next nine months rewriting this trading algorithm. I think it, it took me about half a million lines of code. Wow. I turned it into a trading platform uh, and I, I launched it uh, towards the end of one year. Um, I believe it was towards the end of 2012 or 2013. And very quickly within the first, I posted it on the Bitcoin Talk forum. I was like, look, I made a, a leverage trading platform. I work in a bank, so I learned how the bank does it, does things properly. You know, there was a very cowboy element of the of the industry back then. I thought, look, if there's yeah, any room days, for- It was a, just experiment anyway, nobody cares, right? Yeah, but if there's any room for, for me to succeed, it's by, you know, copying what a bank does as professionally as possible, but in the crypto space where all these kids are just doing all these wild, wild cowboy things. Uh, I, I launched it and announced it on a Bitcoin Talk forum, and I believe within the first month we'd broken about 10 million US dollars worth of transactions. Wow. Yeah, and we'd managed to charge up to a 1% transaction fee wow. on that volume. And again, learning from the lessons in the banking industry, I realized it was a volume game. If you charge a small percentage, but recur that enough, enough times, then it would build into a significant sum. So that's how I ended up running a trading platform. And that time, Magna was a one-man show or you had a team? Uh, it was a one-man band. Wow, it was first. a one-man yeah. band. Yeah, so I was running it in my free time. And during that time, being a startup in the crypto space wasn't something glamorous. It wasn't like today where VCs are all looking at you, <laughs> you know, the world will report about you. But instead, when you go and do this, it was a whole different thing, right? It was yeah. like some jokers who just tried to experiment with some weird internet money that that's meaningless or almost associated with crime at best yeah that that was those days yeah right? yeah yeah and how do you grow from after you left a full-time job and working on this full-time what was that journey like then at that point in time i found myself running a startup there are a few glamorous stories about the startup industry back then you know apple had just you know got gotten got a lot of press facebook was just emerging as a as a leading social media platform and it was a really really exciting time in silicon valley but i don't want to kid anyone i had no clue what i was doing <laughs> uh, one minute i was just playing with this technology that i thought was cool next thing i knew i had to run a company there were customer complaints coming in. I was responsible. I took this mindset back then, even before anyone thought they should take it seriously, that I was managing people's hard-earned money and I should do that with a high level of responsibility and as, as best as I can to you know, protect what people were depositing on my platform. Because there was a point where I just couldn't stop the deposits coming in. And sure, some people may, may paint that as a very glamorous story, but to me, it petrified me because I found myself running a company people sending me money and I wanted to really do the right and honorable thing in every single way possible uh, to run as professionally as I could so I remember going to a wedding once and my friend says to me what are you doing there on that computer I see some codes running I'm just like oh it's just this little thing I'm experimenting with it's called bitcoin but whatever you do don't buy into it because otherwise <laughs> You know, nuts. People used to call me nuts for doing Bitcoin to begin with. My parents did as well. My, well they were like, what are you doing? Why don't you get a real job? There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> the news articles have come out saying drug dealers, uh, criminals, uh, money launderers. And I was like, no, I, I want to do this seriously. My friend says to me, look, this kind of looks serious what you got. And I think I should come on board and help you. Um, so he decided to come on board and help me expand the team. At that point, I realized, look, I've got to do things. If I want to do things properly, I have to incorporate a company, hire a team, start contacting the regulators to say, look, this is a real thing that I think should be regulated. I left a job in financial regulation. Um, and so at that point, I'd committed to m leaving Australia to move back to the UK to to contact some of my old uni friends and say, look, let's, let's try and build a company together. Right. Let's try to make this a startup. So within the first 
first two years we'd we'd gotten to i believe around four or five staff uh i called my old friends from my computer science class i said do you want to come on board i had a friend of mine who's a a, a former car mechanic but he was very detailed oriented i was like okay great you can be my operations guy he would always be on top of everything and he'll keep the whole business in check right. uh take have a look at all the customer complaints um address them as well as he could and yeah just try to wrap a little bit of professionality around how to essentially run a trading platform at that point and don't forget i was just in my late 20s early 30s at this point trying to scramble around figure out how to manage right. manage money yeah. uh, did the reg- regulators took you seriously in the uk during that time absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> absolutely hey, not we have some bitcoin i think you should regulate this um Nah, <laughs> absolutely not. So I mean, months earlier, I'd flown to Japan to negotiate a business deal with with Mt. Gox, one of the largest Bitcoin exchanges. Then, and I was quite happy to hear that the Japanese regulators were on the forefront of taking Bitcoin seriously. I thought, great, armed with that knowledge, I'm going to go to the UK, call my other friend who just so happens to be a lawyer, and be like, look, I need to talk to someone, FCA, the accountants, call, you know, all these big names, PwC. Ernest and Young, let's 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 get all this done properly, right? Have all the legal paperwork, have all the proper bank accounts, have the regulator know who we are, what processes and procedures we follow to protect our client money, you know, segregating the accounts, all these little tricks I learned from banking industry. And they were like, We're not interested in talking to you. I said and I and I sent more emails, I sent it to the innovation division i sent it to the innovation sandbox i was like i'm a crypto company i've incorporated i got a bank account i got employees now we're starting to get interest from investors you know we we think that you should give us some regulatory oversight um we think that we were starting to hold a significant amount of people's money and bitcoin was slowly slowly by more and more people being taken a little bit more seriously but still very reported upon very negatively in the media those weeks and months went by and it turned into years and then eventually the regulators would start reaching out to us but it wouldn't be the uk regulators the us regulators would call us up the sec the cftc would call us up and they say, we're interested in what you're doing. And at that point, what I thought was doing the right thing turned into sheer terror. Basically, there's certain points where if you get emails from certain regulatory divisions, especially from their enforcement divisions, which a lot of these guys were, you knew at that point that they would have, they had a file on you and they were watching you. Right. How many years was that you were running it? For? So I believe that was the second year into running the company, or the third year in, uh, after we'd spent a lot of time and effort reaching out to all right. these regulators, the SEC included. So then what became a, what was supposed to be a responsible behavior turned into sheer terror when I realized that they ignored my messages from the innovation divisions and their enforcement divisions were just contacting me direct because you know wow. at that point they were wanting to build a legal case against you for doing something that they deem my saving grace came from the fact that my operations guy was like look we've got a lot of paperwork of us trying to proactively co- contact them trying to educate them into what bitcoin is what bitcoin does and what procedures financial companies in the space should be using wow and so when we sent these letters back to them saying look we've been trying to contact you at this point not for months but for years they so immediately from the start of the operation we have been trying to tell you that yeah. this is happening and yeah. we have put these measures in place let's discuss but you guys ignore us so now we want to come and find us to enforce some stuff yeah uh, these are the proof that we have tried to reach out to you right yeah so that kind of saved you right yeah i mean we we were quite confident at that point with the team of lawyers that we worked with that look we were doing everything as properly as we could have as properly as the regulators could define um how we should ethically run, illegally run uh, a, a cryptocurrency or a virtual currency business right. back then. Because they didn't know what they were doing either. The uh, The news was coming out that the regulatory agencies in the US were fighting to get oversight. The FCA in the UK started calling me up and saying, look, do you want to come in and give us a talk? They changed their tone. They were like, do you want to come in and give us an educational talk on what this technology does and how it works? 
And I'd be like, look, I know I've got to play a role here. I've got to say, yeah, absolutely. Teach them, tell them, uh, tell them the technology is coming and I've got to embrace it. Uh, But then quite sadly and somewhat disappointingly, they were still very, very skeptical about it. So I fought a lot of discrimination that came in other forms through the the finance industry. Um, Mm. There was a long period of time where bank accounts just indiscriminately got closed down, even though we knew what we were doing was uh, the right thing. Uh, In every instance, we would always check with our lawyers whether what we were doing was was correct and legal mm, and ethical. Mm. And we were always accountable 100% to our clients' funds. And we took that responsibility very seriously. I remember there was one episode where Mount Gox got hacked, right? Yep. And uh, it means during that time, you guys were around as well. And that kind of caught a very, very bad rap for the whole industry, right? Uh, how was it like during that time? Because uh, you're one of the first few guys who, that I know that actually kind of lived through that period as someone in the yeah. industry, not just getting to know the industry. That's an interesting part of the story because uh, that was in the very early days of setting up this 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 cryptocurrency exchange. I'd literally left Sydney to make my way back to the UK to incorporate the company. So it wasn't even a, a properly incorporated company at that point. It was just me as a sole trader just running this website with this magic internet money. I'd hopped on a plane in Singapore and one of my finance guys calls me. He goes... There's news that's breaking that Mt. Gox is going insolvent. At that point, I had a decision to make. Should I board the plane or should I not? Is there much I can do if it's going insolvent? We'd have had a huge balance of money on, on this Mt. Gox exchange. And there's nothing I could do. I boarded the plane. I transited in Dubai. As soon as I landed, I turned on my phone. They're like, it's happening. Mt. Gox is blowing up. And at that point, my stress level went from here to <laughs> through the roof. By the time I'd landed in London, the next call I took straight away was the bankrupts, they filed for bankruptcy, the sure. the money's gone. So all the money that we'd we'd held on the exchange to allow our clients to place trades out to market with was all gone. But thanks to the more conservative way I ran the accounts at the company, uh, we were able to cover every single cent right. of the balances. And uh, because of what I'd learned in the banking industry prior or what I thought people should do when they're running crypto companies is entirely segregate client funds because I'd done that. Actually, what was lost didn't even touch, remotely touch any of the client, right. ba- client balances. So. Your regulatory experience helped you escape that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was quite conservative with the way I did did the accounting in the company as well. So a lot of that money was just my initial seed investment money, which I'd made from my trading platform. Uh, a couple of years earlier. It came to a point that you decided to close the company down, right? Uh, What led to that? Because it's quite interesting to that this whole thing was starting to catch more attention uh, and definitely it was a mix of good and bad, Mm. right? Very polarized opinion on Bitcoin during the time. And it came to a point that you decided to just exit the industry. And it wasn't like you were insolvent or anything. The business was fine. Yep. So what got you to that point to say, enough is enough, let's just close the company? So while on the face of it, it was it was it was great to have a startup. You know, the the people love to talk about us in the in the news as well. You know, they love to cover the stories of our traders using our platform, uh, and they love to cover the fact that you know we did quite a, f- a lot of innovative things. Right, we placed trades directly out to market. We uh, essentially created the first Bitcoin deposits in, in the world and the big first Bitcoin interest-bearing interest, interest bearing product in the world. Um, but it got to a stage where behind the scenes, it was just incredibly stressful. Uh, and in, in, a, in a more personal story to mine, when the market was slow, it wasn't just slow, it was, it was dead. Sure, at first, when I first launched a platform, there would always be trading volume when the market went up. A little bit when it went down but actually in reality it was stressful because the longest bear cycle we ever lived through was a four-year bear cycle where the market just went sideways well for four years trying to run a startup at that point when you know quite a few of us in the company were already working on you know very essentially minimum wage salaries was was really mentally challenging add to that the fact that you know everyone who who loves you and who's very close to you, your parents included are just like look this is not working out you can get a real job there's nothing wrong with that my mom was like look there's nothing wrong with getting a job in finance i know you want to do the startup thing they could see the stress on my face and then on top of that i couldn't really tell people too widely about what we did or the the process and procedures because there was a time in in the world where it was very dangerous to say you ran a cryptocurrency company those stories yeah. of people getting kidnapped or killed or held to ransom. Yeah. It's not the thing that you could be as proud of saying as compared to 
today, right? It's uh, It came with a lot of suspicion. Look, you're either buying drugs <laughs> or selling drugs. Or you're facilitating or a transaction for it. Laundering e- money. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and even when the regulator comes with you at that stance, it's at that point, it's not just stressful. It's it's really consuming to know that they've got a target on your back just by you trying to do a good thing and just trying to incorporate a company, right. pay your taxes as good as you can, given that there's no proper accounting standards around these things, uh, trying to hire people. It was a tough journey for, for me mentally. And so when all of the regulators started chasing me and not necessarily showing interest in regulating us, but wanting to still close just us down. Just want to find some sort of a mistake so that they can penalize you. on the Yeah. Internet. And after, you know, our third or fourth bank account had been closed down at that point, purely because we were a crypto company, um, the stress got too too large for me. And so there was a personal impact in, in my life where I was just like, look, um, we've got enough money on the table so that if we shut down a company in a solvent way, we repack, repay back all of our clients in full. Uh, we repay back all of our shareholders. Uh, we can actually take quite a bit of profits off the table uh, and, and and go on with our lives. We can just take some time off if we need to, um, just figure out what the next big big thing was. So what we did was we exited at that point. We I believe we made a low seven figures, uh, but the big kicker here was once all the accounting was settled and once all the f- legal filings were done to close the company down, the big kicker was when we were able to distribute the funds back uh, to our shareholders, it was all in Bitcoin. Wow. By now, you've already closed down uh, your company, Magnum. Uh, you've exited it. And we can say at this point in time, you are a millionaire already, right? Yeah. So how did life change? Previously, you were struggling as a businessman. I mean, not really struggling financially, but definitely you had the money, but you don't have the time to enjoy. You don't have the mental capacity to enjoy, right? And uh, you came from a poor family background, as you mm. were mentioning. And then now suddenly you're you're a millionaire you are comfortable enough what changed what was the biggest purchase you made immediately how do you spend your money how was the life like in reality nothing spectacular changes didn't you go out straight away and buy yourself like a sport car or an island (laughs) no not not really i mean i was never so invested in a fixed point in a number in and of itself because of what it meant materially you know i was never in it for uh any of the material stuff, but I was in it more for the fact that it gave me options and freedom. Uh, so at the point that I sold my company, look, we'd end up with a, a certain balance and it was enough to buy myself a little bit of time. So what I did was I said to myself, look, that means I can afford to not work for a couple of years now. Um, and it, it didn't cross over to a million immediately um, after I after we took the money out of the company. I'd had some pot from savings and investments from my uni years with my shares. You know, we'd made a little bit of money through the startup, through through owning some cryptocurrencies as well. And, you know, separately, these balances started to grow by themselves and compound, right? So what I thought initially was like, look, I can have two years off, became three years, became five years, became (laughs) 10 years. Um, And then I said to myself, look, when you're in that mind space, it allows you to prioritize different things in life. You know, it allows you to think to yourself, what do I really want to spend my time doing And I explored different things and on my bucket list were things like, look, I've always wanted to uh, move abroad or live in Asia. So I was able to actually dedicate my full time and energy after that point because I was very, very burnt out from all the stress um, mentally, physically. I was was totally drained. My mental health was in a at a low point. My physical health was also at a low point. I said to myself, look, let's focus on different goals. So for me, it was try to get fit learn to eat healthier and uh you know move move to a different country i'd move back to the uk at that point purely to set up the company but it wasn't because i wanted to to live there uh, it's a great place to, to to come from uk is a great place to visit but for, it just wasn't for me to live there long term so that's when i decided to apply for the visa for malaysia to move over here i ended up here and again for me it's not all about the lavish lifestyle you know malaysia's just known for 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 cheap food right and friendly people and 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 good weather and that's the reasons why i i moved here but when i reflect back philosophically over you know reaching these you know personal financial milestones uh, i come to realize that look in in all of the journey i've had up until that point what matters more than the milestone is actually the journey that you've been on 
football along the way. What mattered more to me was, was I able to bring my friends and family along with me uh, on that journey? Because right. if I got to, you know, we always love to joke in the space about Lambo profitability. You know, <laughs> if I got to a point where I could ever buy Lambos, you know, I, I personally don't ever want to be the only guy driving down the road with my Lambo. I want all my friends to be joining me at the same time in their Lambos. And yeah, it's just who I am. So I, I, I explored for a little while. What can I do to, beyond touching on my personal goals, what can I do to, to give back to society as well? So I looked into exploring different things around philanthropy and charity. Uh, ended up in a pull on a missions trip, uh, which was mm. really quite eye-opening for me. And ultimately it culminated in me thinking to myself, look, I can't ignore, once, I, once I'd reached Malaysia and ticked off a couple of my personal life goals, which was to focus on my relationships at that point, to get married, settle down, have a family. I thought to myself very philosophically, look, when I'm talking to other younger startups to mentor them, you know, the advice I always give them is don't ignore what you're passionate about. And although I was quite burnt out from the crypto industry back then, I kept on finding myself still looking at what crypto innovations were coming out, what protocol improvements were coming out. At this point, Ethereum was on the scene. You know, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the Ethereum space. I kept tabs of the ICO days, the NFT days. And I was like, look, if my next 10 years of life is going to mean anything philosophically, what should I spend my time on? I'd still want to be pushing the crypto industry forward in some way, shape or form. And if that means jumping into the arena to do a second company, that's that's what I'm going to do because it enables me to just stay close to the space and keep pushing and advocating for a decentralized crypto right. future. We're definitely going to go into the part of how you end up starting DeFi Dive, which is your current venture. Mm. Uh, I know there are a few interesting parts uh, before that as well, where you met Vitalik Buterin uh, before Ethereum was launched. Yeah, yeah. Can you share with us that experience? Because uh, being a mysterious man himself, I think <laughs> the only thing that I ever got of him was the recent photo of him in Singapore, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but you managed to meet the person himself and that time, he was a nobody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how was that? How do you got in touch with this young man during that time, and uh, how how was that whole experience like? And then being an early investor in Ethereum. Uh, so it's, I think it's interesting to share with the audience that the journey to whatever success you're you're aiming for does not always follow a straight line. You've got to be open to following tangents here and there. And back then when we were running the company, the the, the Bitcoin company, the community is very small. When I first started looking into Bitcoin, the community was maybe a thousand active people on the forums, less than that. Uh, and then it slowly grew larger and it started to be these small grassroots efforts to organize Bitcoin conferences around the world. Because we were one of the only crypto companies in existence as of that time, there were just merely a handful of, of crypto companies back then. We got invited to speak at all these conferences or at least appear there or set up a little booth there. And I believe it was either, I can't remember whether it was Hong Kong Bitcoin conference or uh, Singapore's Bitcoin conference. But at this point we were traveling around the world to New York as well. And one day we were just standing at our booths, you know, a bunch of, essentially we were very nerdy then. We were just a bunch of nerds standing around, young guys, just, you know, this, we were trying to show off banners about, um, you know, what we're doing in a space, trying to, uh, build a trading platform, trying to build financial services for the space, essentially. And this young young kid comes up to us. He introduces himself as Vitalik. He goes, I'm a writer for Bitcoin magazine. Went and Googled him afterwards. And he was just like, yeah, this guy, this kid has a story. And he posts on Bitcoin talk. He's like, if anyone needs any help explaining anything in the Bitcoin space, I, I know I know a thing or two. And yeah, sure enough, he's, he's a very knowledgeable computer scientist, a very respected one. And he would write all these very complicated articles on the Bitcoin magazine. Wow. And he goes, look, uh, he started to write these uh, really philosophical educational papers on what's possible in a computing space. And one of the white papers he released was the Ethereum white paper. So when, when he came along to our booth, he introduced himself as Vitalik. And I got speaking to him about what he was doing with building Ethereum. And he says, look, I essentially want to, to, to break it down in a nutshell with what Ethereum is, it's basically a cloud computer built on the Bitcoin network. And the cost of compute is paid for by the Ethereum cryptocurrency. It's essentially like a cloud service like AWS, mm. but decentralized. And I thought, wow, 
because of what Bitcoin innovated against, you know, what Satoshi built with this protocol, it's enabled somebody to propose a cloud, decentralized cloud computer. And that person was Vitalik. When I spoke to him about it, I was like, this kid is a genius. And I believe he was 17 or 18 at the time. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I saw him a couple of weeks later post on the forums that, look, I'm going to do... Uh, the very first token sale in the world or one of the very first token sales in the world. Uh, this is my white paper, the Ethereum white paper. And I said to my colleague, I was like, hey, that's that kid we met in, uh, I think it was Hong Kong, right? He came and hung out at our booth. It was kind of cool, kind of dorky. But then we felt very comfortable with him because we were also very dorky and very nerdy. Didn't quite know how to stand, felt a bit <laughs> awkward. And didn't really look anyone in the eye properly because we prefer to look at computers of course and we're just like hey do you, do you think his uh his idea is worth worth a little investment and i was like i don't i wouldn't ever recommend it but i'm gonna put a bit of money in there i think it's could be worth something and my friend was like i'm gonna do the same and i was like you're nuts <laughs> <laughs> at every point in my crypto journey especially in the early days whenever i told people that i was doing bitcoin i always told them not to invest in bitcoin and then whenever they inevitably told me they did i would always call them nuts yeah. It's so different from today, right? Where, where <laughs> yeah. people, gurus are selling it like crazy, trading classes and it's so on, true. right? No shills here. If anything, stay safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we ended up investing in what was essentially uh, Ethereum seed round. Uh, and that in and of itself became uh, quite, quite, quite a decent investment for us. Having said that, uh, so over the years, uh, we talked about you uh, making the money, making the millions, and you started off uh, with a decent amount, not great at first, but uh, because of putting your assets in the right places from tech stocks mm. to uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, basically just grew by itself. And that kind of leads you to a life where uh, I would say money is not a problem. Uh, let's not explore how big mm. is that amount, but let's just say the money is not a problem. You also mentioned something very interesting because for you, money wasn't about buying luxuries. It wasn't about material, uh, but it was about finding the freedom. And you mentioned this thing that you have a bucket list right mm. uh, can you share with us what's on your bucket list and what are the things that you have accomplished so far yeah i think to in inspire the audience i think it's very important just to have goals in life as well so when i was uni age i you know i i, I saw this movie called the bucket list and also the yes man which encouraged you simultaneously to to take risks and dare to do things different and i'd written down a bucket list which basically included personal goals and life goals it was to travel the world back in that time to live an expat life to work abroad which ended up being australia uh, to there was on the it was on my list to, to set up a company at some point in my life to visit an f1 race and on the financial goals side of things it was to to make a million dollars and followed right next to that was to to donate a million dollars and you know, all these things back then when I was at uni were just absolutely ridiculous goals that I would never thought in a million years I would ever reach or attain. But there were goals nevertheless to work towards. So that I, in some ways it gave me aspiration that once in a while when I would check this list that I'd write, I'd check it roughly every year, around about New Year's time, around about Christmas time. I'd say to myself, actually, I'm starting to make progress on some of these. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I think if, if ever there's a le lesson for anyone in the audience is to yeah, give yourself goals and don't be afraid to, to make them ambitious because you never know where life will take you. And maybe you'll get the opportunity to, to reach some of your, your financial goals. Um, but yeah, for me, it was always about having a pure enough motive to, to have the, these goals as well. So whilst it was really good to set myself a financial goal of to be able to make a million, but I always thought to myself, wouldn't it be even cooler if the motivation to make that much was to help others to that, that degree as well? Yeah. So you, you mentioned in that bucket list, uh, one of the things was uh, to to give away a million bucks. Uh, did that happen ultimately? It's happening. Yeah, I'm quite far into that goal, although that's a goal that I tend to keep more to myself. It's one that's very personal to me, uh, but one that's really exciting to me. Uh, to be able to give back in many different ways is... It's just a different feeling, uh, but it's personal because the metric for giving as well can be very different. Uh, well, at I'm least I'm very sure in the in the terms of a uh, coffee money that you there compensated you already uh, was uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably haven't, about the number. Haven't yeah. counted that, but if you did, yeah, it's it's it's. it's, it's, <laughs> I, it's I believe that's not part of the calculation, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but I mean, giving once you get the opportunity to run a business can be quite multifaceted as well. Like you're giving t uh, salaries to 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 people you want to hire as well. You're you're paying your your taxes as well on top of that as well. You're paying for services from 
accountants if they're your friends you can call them up and give them the business as well lawyers you know i've got a very close friend of mine who's been a lawyer for me for the last 20 years and i don't hesitate to give him a call and give him that business as well so there's many ways and many facets to being able to be generous uh, and yeah to be able to have that that money to be able to give to the people you want to support is, is is quite empowering also in in the time that i had off when i was exploring charitable giving i kind of came to realize that you could still be charitable in in the world we live in today by spending your money at vendors who you feel like deserve to earn that amount because yes. what's better than than just indiscriminately giving somebody money who needs it is supporting say the auntie who set up a noodle shop to sell noodles to feed her family right and i in some ways i feel like giving in that respect even though you may be paying more than the market price is a very noble way to express. Yeah, right. it's a very, and you're lifting somebody out of poverty who's actually willing to work for it as well. Let's move to the last thing is that uh, I think you have achieved pretty much many of the things on your bucket list. I think it's about time to renew that bucket list. <laughs> I know that one of the things there that you still want that is definitely part of this new bucket list of yours is DeFi Dive, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, that's one of your way of giving. That's one of your way of uh, pursuing something that you're still passionate about. Can you tell us about DeFi Dive? Like, uh, what is it all about? Because at this point right now, many people are definitely asking this question. For someone like you, who's definitely do not need to do this, yeah, you're definitely not doing it for the money anymore. So why are you putting yourself through this whole thing all over again, going out, pitching, talking about the business? when yeah you can just enjoy your life so so when I, I did take some time off i ended up taking about three or four years off when during that time i was exploring what i should be doing next and when i asked myself at the end of the day look if i was to look back at the end of life and see what it all meant you know if i was to connect the dots backwards could i pass on happily knowing that i just spent the last say 10 20 i don't know how long it's gonna be 30 40 years of my life just not really doing much beside besides improving my goal swing. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to myself, look, what I've always been passionate about, what I always go back to is I can't help but keep tabs on on the crypto industry. Um, at this point, I'd say I'm addicted, right? And look, I always think in every great business, especially as someone who's, who's Christian, who's religious as well, I, I said to myself, look, what better way to make money than to first give? What can I give to others? And from that, a great product mindset comes about. What, I, what me and some of my friends spend a lot of time doing and some of my former clients spend a lot of time doing was at that point uh, spending a lot of time trying to manage crypto assets because it became an absolute nightmare. In 2024, we stand here, we sit here discussing this today. There's NFTs, there's tokens, there's meme coins, there's real world assets, there's AI tokens in a whole host of different layer one networks, layer two networks, side chains, and to manage your crypto estate is becoming very, very complex and it's leading to a lot of people losing a lot of money through different exchanges. Mm. There isn't a product out there yet that is essentially like what a Bloomberg terminal is for crypto. Uh, the investment banks use Bloomberg terminal to manage their trading positions, to manage their assets. So I said to myself, why don't I take that level of professionality and inject it into the cryptocurrency space and build a Bloomberg terminal for crypto uh, with the sole purpose of helping people manage crypto assets. And so the idea for DeFi Dive came about quite naturally. Let's build a product that we ourselves would be proud of using and knowing that it will help us and help our community of friends and former uh, business partners and, and former clients. Let's just try to grow the business as organically as possible. And it still keeps me, it gives me the ability to, to stay close to the space. Uh, and it gives me this mindset of being able to work on something being able to be productive and push the agenda of cryptocurrency. I still believe it should be mass adopted. I believe it's a great hedge against fiat currencies and the currency printing that central banks around the world does. And I think it should be an integral part of every single bank and investment bank in the future, just because it's so much technologically, it's so much more efficient than what currently exists. Mm. And who ends up winning? The end users, the mortgage payers, the people who, who are saving money in their bank accounts, the, the poorest of society would benefit from uh, the whole of finance being built on cryptocurrency rails. And so I'm pushing for the adoption of that through building cryptocurrency infrastructure. That's really, really interesting. For those of you guys who are interested in finding what DeFi Dive does, uh, go and check out their website. Uh, we'll put the link in the description. Yeah, and uh, they do write some 
crazy good articles, I would say. Uh, one of the recommended read is about Dogecoin and what it teaches us about human behavior. I read that article as well. And time to time, I would actually read your stuff and then I would take the inspiration and put it as part of my newsletter uh, and crediting to you guys as well. So now, last question before we end this whole thing. You have lived through life as someone who had lack of resources and now you are sitting in a position where resources are not lacking anymore. What changed for you from this whole 30 to 40 years of your life, right? Uh, you're just a little bit older than me, so about 40 right now, right? Yeah, so what do you see is the most significant change from last time until today? For me, the thing that wealth enabled me to have a lot more flexibility with my time. It allowed me to save, spend a little bit more money to save time so that you could spend more time doing the things that you wanted to do as opposed to the things that you felt like you needed to do. So a lot of people have this, uh, have jobs that they don't like, they have nine to fives, which they feel like they have to force themselves to go to just to pay their mortgage. So in some ways they're, they're, they're a little bit chained in that respect, but look at building financial stability as a goal that allows you the freedom to make that choice as to whether to continue going to that job or not, or whether to look for a better job elsewhere. And I think if you use your money in that way as a tool to enable you to park closer to the grocery store, <laughs> to take the valet once in a while, to pay someone to wash your car, then that's absolutely a luxury that you can and should enjoy. And yeah, for me, I, I start to pay a lot more for convenience uh, to be able to buy myself time in other ways, to be able to invite friends out for golf or <laughs> to play video games, for example. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate for you giving yourselves these incentives. There's nothing wrong if you want to spend all your time playing video games all day. But I feel like for me, I've always told myself I've got to earn that right to be right. able to do that. And being able to just fulfill all my obligations, um, my house payments, my childcare nowadays, uh, being able to pay that responsibility, but still being able to you know, go home and play video games late at night <laughs> is it feels a lot more satisfying in that right. respect uh yeah i'm still really curious before i close this um after making money right uh what is the most expensive thing that you actually splurge on because uh, knowing you for quite a while um i i don't really see anything that you splurge on uh that's i i mean i'm not a wife so i wouldn't know yeah. <laughs> uh, but you drive a very simple car <laughs> i've not seen you wear an expensive watch or expensive clothes yeah so what is it that you splurge on at all, right? I mean, the last thing I heard is bought a house, but yeah. But also it's a it's kind of like a middle middle class upper house. It's not even a luxurious luxurious house per se. So what is it that you splurge on? I'm really really curious. I've started to travel a lot more nicer. So I've I've traveled a business class and first class at this point. <laughs> I have got one nice watch actually, uh, but that I don't take out very often. But besides that, it's uh, yeah. I've just started to buy slightly nicer clothes. That's slightly nicer food things like that but yeah not i'm i've not Nothing really too glamorous, right? out but too much so you are you're kind of like ramit sethi right where where there's this uh, american personal finance guru yeah i uh, would drive a simple honda but whenever he travels he will actually uh, take business class or first class yeah because yeah, yeah. that's just his thing look i'm, I'm not saying it's not going to happen at some <laughs> point you may see me pull up in a lambo but <laughs> Look, I think for me... Like, Maybe after the, this cycle, huh? that, <laughs> For me, that delayed gratification is important. Look, the most important things are your, your house, the roof over your head, a vehicle to get you from A to V, but beyond that, diminishing yeah. marginal returns, right? So I'm not saying it's not going to happen. At some point, you may see me pull up in something nice because I do, I do like cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just not... not yet the right time right yeah so maybe i'll see you with better club soon <laughs> uh, how about how about when you reach that lambo profitability we both go out and get one together that that may take a very long time but yeah that sounds great <laughs> <laughs> any last words that you want to impart to our audience uh for especially people who are thinking about how they save or invest to become rich because one thing that you say right to mm. me was this you did not actually became rich because of the company that you exited. Mm. That just gave you a head start. But what helped you to sustain through 
was investment decisions that were wise. So yep. maybe just some last words for our audience because I believe this is extremely relevant mm. to many people out there. So I just want to really, really encourage anybody, especially if they're young, especially if they're just graduating, to have a passion, pursue a career in something that you're really interested in, but also be very realistic about what that career can earn you. Sure, you may want to choose the arts or something like cooking food, but realize there's a limit. So do your research, the knowledge is out there. Just follow your dreams and follow your passion. But always challenge yourself to educate yourself more than what you currently know and challenge your misconceptions because especially if you're to grow up in an underprivileged family or even from wealth, a lot of what you might have been taught by your older peers might not be accurate. So get out there, learn about finance, learn about compounding. These things are not secrets. It's not snake oil. It's the, the world of finance is very, very transparent. There's some great resources such as your, your YouTube channel where you can find out about these concepts, especially compounding, uh, where it can really make a huge difference in, in your life in the long run. And if you get started younger, it's, it's going to have a hugely mathematically amplifying effect um, where you'll start to see your wealth level really hockey stick. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, so guys, uh, if you like this episode today, uh, please leave a comment, share with us what are some of the things that you've learned and uh, what are some of the things that inspire you from this interview with Joe. So thank you very much for joining us. We will see you next time.